uh, of ICT. Um, so I'm Mike Wine. Uh, I work for the Community Security Trust in England. It's the defense agency of the Jewish community. Uh, we're funded by the community, but we work very closely uh, with government and with police. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also the UK member of ECRI, which is the monitoring commission of the Council of Europe, which is the standard-setting authority for Europe. I monitor member states' compliance with the Human Rights and Terrorism Conventions, um, and we go around each member state and poke our nose where it's not wanted. Um, that's me. Uh, our our panelists are Dr. Anika Borg, uh, who is a theologian uh, who's been working on de-radicalization in Sweden. Uh, Professor Rowan Gunaratna, uh, who you, if you've been here for the last few days, you will have heard, uh, who is the director of the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research in Singapore. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Daniel Morrow, who was for 25 or so years uh, the um, producer and main presenter of the main uh, current affairs uh, program on Italian national television uh, and who is an expert in particular on North Africa. Um, Sultan Shahin, uh, who has not yet arrived, uh, but who is on his way, who is the editor of New Age Islam, uh, which promotes progressive interpretation of Islam, and who has been researching and writing and working on de-radicalization. Um, unfortunately, my longtime friend uh, and colleague Rashad Ali, uh, who was coming from the UK, uh, cannot now come. His passport was stolen a few days ago, uh, and he's been unable uh, to uh, get it replaced in time to, to, to get here, which is a great shame because uh, uh, unlike the rest of us, uh, he has been a radical. He was one of the leaders of Hizbut Tahrir. He studied at Al-Azhar and at the Jamati Islami Center, which is the equivalent of the Ikhwan Center in the UK, uh, and was for many years uh, the main theologian uh, of Hizbut Tahrir, uh, both in the UK uh, and elsewhere. Uh, but circumstances intervened. The speakers in this workshop have been asked to look at how de-radicalization works, if indeed it does, in the countries or regions they come from. In doing so, I hope that we can draw out some good ideas and best practices which you can take away if, if, if you're uh, practitioners or indeed even if you're academics. To do this, we first need to understand how radicalization works, to know who's doing the radicalization, who the targets are, the importance of social networks and the internet, the trend towards self-radicalization, why and how it's important, and the role of mosques and religious leaders, both in radicalizing and in resisting radicalization. We have to understand that Muslim communities in the West and in non-Muslim majority states lack cohesive infrastructures which the state can rely on in this task. And governments have to differentiate and make public that differentiation between helping Muslim communities to build capacity and using those communities for intelligence gathering. It seems that the successful de-radicalization strategies adopt a holistic approach involving intelligence gathering, educators, social services and families. As, uh, Rowan was, uh, was discussing the other day, uh, a European Commission funded program on de-radicalization a few years ago in which I participated initially brought together police and security services representatives from around Europe. The final report, after two, nearly two years, however, focused on a multi-agency approach, with the lead being taken by social services. An illustration of how ISIS recruits online was provided in a BBC news item in July, in which the teenage brother of a young man who had joined ISIS in Syria set up a fake Twitter account and searched for ISIS. He was very quickly contacted by an ISIS supporter, and within hours he had amassed about 5,000 followers, he said. He subsequently became close to six online contacts, some in Syria and some in the West. There was no hard sell by sinister puppet masters, but he was exposed to a constant stream of propaganda, which promoted the concept of payback for the persecution of Sunnis at the hands of Iraqi Shia. He had started to watch the videos he was being sent, and 
he said, I became heart heartened. After reading about sheer crimes against local Sunnis, I remember watching a video of an execution of an Iraqi soldier and thinking, good. He realized that he was becoming radicalized, just like his brother. According to a recent report uh, by the FBI Counterterrorism Division, there was a change in ISIS operations at the turn of 2014-2015 when they posted 100 or so names and photos on social media notice boards and told their followers, followers to attack and kill any of those on the notice boards that they could access. By April 2015, ISIS was proactively contacting those with whom they were in contact from amongst their thousands of social media followers, directing them to encrypted communications in order to, to direct them to undertake specific tasks against either specified local individuals or against general targets, such as the local police or soldiers. According to another report, ISIS published another list recently. This was the origin of this summer's heightened threats in Australia, the USA, Canada and the UK, in which ISIS used social media to connect targets and potential terrorists. They told their followers not to travel to Syria, gave them a list of potential local targets, which was hyper-focused, with a succession of sensitive anniversaries, Anzac Day, VE Day, 4th July. The instruction was to use whatever weapons came to hand. The very personal means of social media is responsible for shortening the flash-to-bang lead times. Attackers may be known to the authorities, but they haven't done anything for which they might be on a watch list in the early stages of radicalization. Obviously, individuals with mental health or other issues are the most vulnerable to this form of suggestion, and close liaison with psychiatric and educational authorities is necessary. So, de-radicalization requires close collaboration between multiple agencies. Silo thinking and practice has to be a thing of the past. The Danish city of Aarhus seems to have developed a workable strategy which has been described as almost naive in its simplicity. This is a city from which 13 men went to Syria in 2013. Five were killed, 10 remained, but 16 returned. Approximately 250 people worked to spot young Muslims who were becoming radicalized. Once identified, they were approached by authorities in conjunction with a local imam in the hope of turning them away. And although it is said to work, it fails to recognize that many are radicalized in prison. Omar Hussein, the attacker of the Copenhagen journalist meeting and the synagogue, was most certainly radicalized in prison, although witnesses say that he suffered psychiatric problems as well. An Afghani-born lawyer who works in the suburbs from which he came described him as a violence-prone, delusional loner. And this illustrates two of the key triggers, people who are disorientated and people who suffer from psychi psychological problems. The Aarhus strategy seems to work because it's based on early recognition, cordiality, i.e. no force, and integration. It's a bottom-up strategy which involves street workers, teachers and parents, all of whom are provided with some psychology training. And in fact, there's an update on the, uh, the Aarhus uh, strategy, uh, which came in the wake uh, of uh, the investigation into the Copenhagen uh, attacks, uh, which was chaired on behalf of the Danish government by our colleague um, uh, who, who spoke yesterday. Um, and uh, I can commend uh, the report of the commission too. It's about 20 pages. It seems to follow the Aarhus strategy, but uh, he tells me that uh, it's a little bit further developed. This is Magnus Ransdorp, uh, who spoke yesterday. In the UK, there's a statutory duty to de-radicalize. The Terrorism Act of 2015 places a statutory duty on specified authorities to have due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. Prevent the strand within the, count the contest counter-terror strategy, which focuses on de-radicalization, has three specific objectives. To respond to the ideological challenge of terrorism and the threat from those who promote it, to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism and ensure that they are given appropriate advice and support, to work with those institutions and sectors where there are risks of, of radicalization. Recent comments on PREVENT came recently from two senior police officers who are Muslims, uh, and they offer completely contrasting assessments. Chief Superintendent Dal Babu, who retired in 2013, uh, told the BBC that most Muslims do not 
trust, prevent. He was quoted as saying that, sadly, prevent has become a toxic brand and most Muslims are suspicious of what prevent is doing. On the other hand, Commander Makshishti, uh, who is in charge of community relations for the Metropolitan Police, in an interview more recently, urged a more intrusive prevent strategy, saying that it needed to move into the private space of Muslims to spot views that could show the beginnings of radicalization. Prevent was modified in 2011 to deal with all forms of terrorism, that is, far right as well as uh, jihadi, and with non-violent extremism, which can create an atmosphere conducive to terrorism and can popularize views which terrorists then support. According to a police comment to the press two weeks ago, there has been a 32% rise in counter-terrorism arrests in London over the past 12 months, with 225 people being held, including 29 females and 17 teenagers, of whom five were girls. Over the two-year period, there have been 396 arrests from which 186 terrorism-related charges have come to court. So you can see that the UK has a very substantial problem. We also have to recognize the changing age and background of those being radicalized. In a case which currently is before the courts in Manchester, a 16-year-old schoolgirl has admitted terrorism charges after bomb-making recipes were found on her cell phone, along with pictures of dead children, executions, and ISIS propaganda. Phone data retrieved by the police show she had exchanged more than 16,260 WhatsApp communications with a 14-year-old boy who lived in a neighboring town who had recently admitted charges of inspiring an attack in Australia on Anzac Day. This is one of the three cases that uh, Richard Walton referred to in his presentation the day before yesterday. She had also sent thousands of messages to an 18-year-old, Sevdat Bessim, an Australian, who shared their admiration for ISIS. The girl had used her school IT system to search for information on UK-born ISIS terrorists, probably because she'd read about them in the media, and this may have been what sparked her interest. She then reverted to a Blackberry. In her initial defense, she stated that she had sketched out a bomb-making recipe for school after watching Blue Peep. Blue Peter. I'm guessing that very few of you know about Blue Peter. It's a long-standing, very good children's television program that teaches kids to make useful things out of toilet roll holders and sellotape, things like that. Um, According to recent press reports, the British police now aim to enlist former Islamists and some of those convicted of jihadi terrorist offences to develop new counter-narratives. They report they are already receiving significant help and they're keen to develop more. The police added that repentant jihadis offer a valuable alternative to those who were killed fighting for ISIS. And this is why I really regret the absence of Rashad Ali, because this is what he does. He works in the prisons, de-radicalizing on a one-to-one -one basis, and on the basis of a very deep knowledge of Islam, uh, but also on the basis of having been one of the ideological leaders of Hizbut Tahrir. Uh, he's able to talk to them in their own terms and argue with them and batten them down. So it seems, in the UK, Denmark at least, uh, that it's a collaborative approach that now prevails. Uh, a conference on preventing and detecting radicalization in education is due to take place at the end of this month in London, and this will bring together educators and CT ed uh, experts. The agenda includes workshops on collaborating uh, with all public sector organizations in CT policy work, emerging good practice in schools and colleges, why young women join ISIS, working in partnership to prevent radicalization, the role of the voluntary sector, and so on. This family-based approach was discussed in a meeting of the Sudanese Doctors' Union of Britain and Ireland held in London three weeks ago. It was a fascinating meeting. It explored the theme of youth culture, radicalization, and extremism. And many of the participants were parents of or who knew the young men who had been radicalized in Sudan and have gone off to join ISIS, including the group that made the news headlines recently. I don't know whether anyone is aware, but uh, the medical school in uh, Khartoum seems to be a, a, a focus for recruitment and radicalization. 
Uh, the, in, the participants in this meeting were almost entirely middle and upper middle class, highly educated professional people with few financial constraints, but they all expressed a sense of homelessness. Some had lived in Saudi Arabia but said it was not their home, and they agonized over their children's future uh, in, and their failure to adapt to new homes. Others said the same thing about the UK as well. I'm going to cut short my, my address uh, and just come to the last couple of points. Um, the participants, the parents at this meeting, who as I say were mostly medics or spouses of medics, said that they believe that shame and guilt is a driver for radicalization. Identity grievances, both real and imagined, can create the breeding ground for a number of psychological consequences, and the events that trigger these feelings often take place during times of transition. Supporting people through outreach programs can help them develop resilience. They found that discrimination is central to the experience of those who are radicalized and the failure of many Muslim communities to integrate into their host society in turn lays the foundation for more radicalization. They found that the internet plays both a positive and a negative role. Online radicalization merely complements offline processes and very often presents the line of least resistance. The testimonies therefore reinforce the importance of counter-speech and positive measures to tackle all forms of extremism. Lastly, the absence of critical thinking skills may increase vulnerability to radicalization. Many participants in these projects acknowledge that they were unable to critically engage with the underlying arguments which supported the extremist narrative to which they had subscribed. I'm going to stop there and uh, Tulu is going to show you a brief uh, television documentary which was aired uh, last week on the BBC. It's one of a series which examines how people have been radicalized uh, and they have looked at uh, jihadis, both potential terrorists and people who have moved into terrorism as well as people from the extreme right and I think it's really quite instructive. To we will then go to each of the And my beliefs, yeah? I was thinking I've got, I've got nothing to lose and I, and I have a lot of to win. If I die, if they shoot me or anything, I'm not going to lose anything except my life. different ways that the government, the police and British institutions can deal with people considered radical. De-radicalize them, arrest them, control them, recruit them, silence them. So what does each involve? What works and what might backfire? I've been examining each of these measures, asking which are successful and speaking to the people subject to them. They have views that many consider offensive, but that's why they're called radical. In 2002, Hanif Qadir went to Afghanistan to fight for Al-Qaeda. He admits he was radicalized and now works with the government to stop others taking a similar path. That's why he knows Adam. Adam, who I've given a different name, is Polish. He's 28 and a convert to Islam. He's on the government's de-radicalization program, which is called Channel. This is part of the Prevent Agenda, aimed at stopping people being drawn into violent extremism. The Channel program is very secretive. I've been trying to speak to someone on it for five years, and this is the first time I've been able to. They found me on the street, like they start talking to me, you know? And then they bring me here and they introduce me to Hanif. They didn't know he was a Muslim. He was homeless, he was, was it a telephone box. He was sitting there. We give him a place, we find him a place to stay overnight. And then a few days went by. There was a focus group here. But the guy that was running the focus groups came up to me and, and said to me that he had some concerns about a participant and he couldn't give me the name because it was confidential. 
So I went to some of the other participants and I found out that he was this man they were referring to. So I sat down and started talking to him. And that's when I realized that, you know, this man needs some serious, serious help. Because as far as he was concerned, the Charlie Hebdo killers done the right thing. And the ones who insult the Prophet deserve to die. Is that right? When you saw the Charlie Hebdo attacks, you thought that was justified? That's what I was thinking, yeah. They do the right thing. I was thinking they deserve to die. Because how Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was a holy man, yeah? Why they make the things like that? Hanif discovered Adam had a complex background. Before being found by his team in London, he'd been living in Paris. I was learning about Islam, but the books which I received, I didn't know they're, 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 they're extremists, you know? Because it's like you go into the school, you, they give you a book and, you know, like, in the ex extremist books, there is nothing, they're not saying directly kill the people or things like that. Because the book is very nice, right that, you know, in, in beautiful language, or I can say like that. But it's just the way the book makes you feel after you read. You understand? I went to France, I was meet some people, Muslims, who were showing me like... Um, you know, like in Syria there is a war, yeah? So I have, I, I was seeing live uh, videos, yeah? They have body cameras, you know? They, they make videos. So I see many of these videos and I see training videos, you know? Were these people dangerous? I think these were people that were linked to some networks within Syria and Iraq. May have had some links with um, the Charlie Hebdo situation. I was, I was watching what is going on in the world and I see <clears throat> other people, they, like, they, know, they, they, they do nothing about, you understand? Intentionally, he's not a terrorist, you know, but by default and by of his naiveness, was prepared to do something nasty. I realized that how easy it was for somebody to manipulate him. You know, everything was crumbling all around him. He's lost his job. His family had crumbled around him. Were you prepared to go and fight in Syria and Iraq? I was thinking first about training and then thinking about to go fight. I was thinking I've got, I've got nothing to lose and I, and I have a lot of to win. If I die, if they shoot me or anything, I'm not going to lose anything except my life. He was a problem, of course. As far as I was concerned, and, and some of my team, we were convinced that if we didn't intervene with him, if we didn't engage with him and provide him with the support, I don't think he'd have been around. I think he'd have probably gone abroad and either been killed or killed others. In all, more than 4,000 people have been referred to the program that Adam's on since 2006, the Channel Program. Between 2006 and 2007, only five people were referred. Between 2008 and 2010, that had increased to 467 people. And between 2013 and 2014, it had more than doubled to 1,281 people referred to Channel. It's the hard end of the government's prevent agenda. The people that end up on it have been identified as someone potentially on a path to violent extremism. This leads to an assessment and a bespoke program of de-radicalization is created for them. The PREVENT agenda is highly controversial. As part of it, teachers and academics are required to look out for signs of extremism. It's been accused of vilifying British Muslims in particular and silencing legitimate debate, especially criticism of British foreign policy. So how does this work? You identify he's a problem and then what happens? So I would then tell the local authorities and the local authorities would have a panel meeting, which includes the police, which would include other you know, statutory service providers like mental health services, education services. So whatever needs there may be for this individual, we will put them around him as soon as possible to, to mentor him and, and provide that intervention. Is he basically now on some sort of terror watch list? No, no, no. And this is one thing that people don't understand about Channel is that you don't go on any watch list. It's just a, it's just a, a, a program that allows an organisation like us to come together to provide a support network around an individual of concern who may be on a path to extremism or, or radicalism. And clearly, in this case, he was very much so on a path to terror. So we've pulled him back from the edge, let's say. I think he's one of the high-risk cases we've, you know, we work with. 
prevent and channel are so controversial. So many Muslims see them as spying programs. Do you understand why? I see that. Do, do you think they partially are? Don't get me wrong, we've had parents who are very suspicious of why is, you know, why are their children looked upon by the police or the, by the local authorities as suspicious? Is it because they're Muslim? But then after, after the, the child's been taken through the process and the child's admitted to the parents that I could have been in Syria, they don't understand the reality of the threat to their children and to our communities. I'm going to stop it there. It only goes on for a few more minutes, but I think that you get the essential message. Uh, what I will now ask our uh, panelists to do is to make their presentations, um, and we'll do it in alphabetical order. So, Annika, do you want to do it from there or, or here? Up to you. Thank you. Uh, first, I want, is, is it all right though, like this? Okay. <laughs> I thought it was a bit low. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll start again. First, uh, I want to thank uh, Professor uh, uh, Boas Ganor and the board and Mike Wine for the kind invitation to participate in this uh, conference. I'm very glad to be here, and it has been two days listening to excellent speakers from various fields. So thank you again. It's an honor to be here. Before I start, I want to make a few remarks. Um, I come from Sweden, a country in the outskirts of Northern Europe. And I will highlight the conference team issues from this perspective. I will make examples from this singular country, but I think that some of the experience made in my country say something about the current situation in Europe and the challenge, challenges and threats that are at stake there. Secondly, uh, my field of research is theology, analyzing belief systems, ideas, ethics, and value systems. I have specialized in the field of uh, religion, power, and gender, and how they interact and what that means. So my perspective, or more correctly, my starting point, is slightly different from what we have heard so far. But religion is the core of the challenges and the threats we are addressing, or should I say, from a Swedish point of view, trying, struggling, to address. I also frequently participate in the Swedish public debate about these issues, uh, domestic policies as well as the Swedish foreign policy. I write articles, I lecture on the subject and I also write editorials and debate. To my background is also, I have to add, that I'm an ordained minister in the Church of Sweden. As such, I, for example, was working as a prison chaplain in Stockholm. I'm not active as a priest today, but I want to say that this uh, about my background because I've seen the inside of religion, so I'm going to highlight the issues from this perspective. Third, the topic for this uh, workshop is sharing best practices. And I do not want to start at, as the first uh, speaker in the panel by being too pessimistic. But the truth is uh, that Sweden, and that goes for some other countries as well, are not yet there, but still trying to grasp what has and what is happening. In a few words, there are no control, no strategy, and no coordination whatsoever. Uh, but uh, I am going to uh, also to present uh, some solutions at the end of my talk. And I think it's very important to highlight and discuss and show this uh, 
essays to try to grasp the situation. Because the situation is new for a country that has not been in war or severe conflict for several hundred years, a welfare state with stable institutions and actually no big surprises or threats to deal with. It is a slow and a harsh awakening and we are just beginning to open our eyes and realize that we, Swedes, are in the midst of world conflicts due to the demographic change, for one thing. So I want to share uh, with you my perspectives from the northern outskirts. And yes, I do, as I said, have some solutions or practices that has to be implemented. And now I'm going to change the slide. How do I do it? Where? Here? Okay. Thank you. Well, this is Sweden. I can imagine that you have your own associations when it comes to this country. Maybe the rather dark movies from the famous director Ingmar Bergman. And maybe the stereotype of the Swedes that we are always depressed. We are not, but sometimes, as everybody else. Or perhaps you associate to snow, freedom, equality, or our beautiful uh, nature. However, this is today, Sweden is today also a country where over 300 citizens, as Dr. Magnus Ronstar pointed out yesterday, have traveled to Syria to fight with ICE. Or you say, is ISIS. Our authorities actually do not know how many, and I will come back to that, at least 300. Just some year ago, the Swedish security service said it was about 30 citizens. Earlier this year, they said 130, but now the number estimated it is at least 300. And recently, the authorities said that 30 to 40 women have gone to Syria and increasing. In Sweden, there are 55 no-go zones around the big cities, such as Stockholm, Gothenburg and Malmö. These are zones where police, medical personnel and fire brigades, but also mailmen and bus drivers are at risk because they can be attacked with stones or harassed or hindered to perform their, their duty and their work. We have had some quite upsetting reports about this uh, during the recent month. Sweden is today a part of the world's conflicts. It is a country with a very problematic segregation. An open heart to immigrants, but a very no strategy for social integration in society. And this has created enclaves of ethnic groups uh, during, ac actually throughout Sweden, but mostly concentrated in the suburbs of the big cities. It is a country who cherish the idea of multiculture, but has confused it with multiculturalism, which has resulted in a segregated society debated every day in infected, if infected debates in Swedish media. Our previous right-wing government, today we have a minority coalition with Social Democrats and the Green, said that Sweden is a humanitarian superpower. That is truly a good and beautiful intention but the reality is more challenging. This is what define our country in many ways. Equality. Uh, we are the most, the country in the world most famous for equality. In Sweden, Equality between the sexes and between all uh, different groups are a state ideology. We have paternity leave, paid paternity leave, and we have uh, a female archbishop from Germany in Sweden. 
equality is in the Swedish root system, and this is also this idea is also challenged now. Sweden is the most secularized country in the world. When you take a part of the World Values Service, you will find uh, Sweden in the upper right corner as the most individual country with individual uh, with values uh, concentrating on the individual and the individual's goals, uh, equality, and a very very loose. Uh, contact and connection to institutionalized religion. In, in Sweden, 6.5 out of approximately 9 million people are a member of the big Lutheran Swedish church, but they don't go to church, they don't connect to the message, but they are members, paying a fee, but it's more seen as a part of their cultural heritage. Homogeneous culture. I said that Sweden is a multicultural country. That is true if you look at it in one way. When you look at it in another way, it's a very segregated country and also with a very homogeneous culture. Immigrants are often saying it's very hard to, to get into the culture, to know and understand the core of the culture, because they are not given any guidance, and that's, that's true. We are very homogeneous, and we also are very consensus-thinking people. We want everybody to be on, on the same bus at the same time, going the same way. Otherwise, we get nervous and we are very afraid of conflicts, both in society and in our personal individual life. And that's not a stereotype, actually, it's the truth. Um, uh, Professor Yuri Reichmann spoke the first morning about one of the big problems when we counter terrorism, and that is the naivety. And that's a fundamental. Um, thing in Sweden, the naivety when we are approaching these issues. And as I also said, we have a great moral confidence, seeing ourselves as a humanitarian superpower. Now I'm going to change the picture of Sweden. I'm sure Everybody knows what this is. This is the 11th of December 2010. It is two days before the, the big tradition in Sweden, I think you've heard of it, Lucia, you know, woman with, with long hair going with light and candles and singing. We usually uh, surprise our Nobel Prize winner with that in the morning when they visit Stockholm. Some become very afraid of that. I don't know what's going on. This is just a few days before this, uh, this uh, holiday and this uh, tradition. And it's a street in Stockholm called Bryggargatan. It is in the commercial center of Stockholm. Just a few minutes, five, ten minutes before this, uh, there had been a car bomb in the neighborhood. And this neighborhood, it's at this time, filled with people doing their Christmas shopping. It's a very big thing all over the world almost, but in Sweden, extremely, it's extremely big. And they are shopping, out eating. Uh, a lot of people is in this area. The center, big center station uh, is just a couple of minutes from this place. And what happened was that we had a suicide bomber, Taimur uh, Abdul Wahab raised in Sweden, uh, in a small town in the south of Sweden, called Tranås. And this is five years ago. Uh, nobody have heard in Sweden about ISIS. Uh, and the fact that this suicide bomber fortunately uh, failed. So he killed himself. Uh, but nobody else. And the estimates did um, the estimated power in this bomb was that had he succeeded, he would have taken 40 to 60 people with, her, with him. And it was crowded. This is a crowded area. What happened in the Swedish 
debate about this. And what, hap what happened in the political discussion, in the discussion about security, almost nothing. In columns in the Swedish newspapers, we could read about that this was a person who we were supposed to feel sorry for. He was, uh, he was feeling outside the society. And that may be true, but that was the whole debate. In fact, Taimur had moved a couple of year, years earlier to, uh, to UK. He was radicalized, perhaps previously in Sweden. They don't know yet, or maybe will ever know. But in Luton, in Great Britain. He was radicalized. And he also, uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, the police uh, were given the information that he had actually traveled to Iraq. And when this um, attack was performed, they were also sent a message to the police and to the Swedish broadcasting company uh, talking about an Islamic state. But nobody picked that, that up at that point. For me, this was a turning point because this was a suicide attack, although uh, it was only one casualty, it was a suicide attack. But the aftermath in the media was a completely different discourse. It was a discourse who um, highlighted the ethical facts about the Swedish society not doing enough for people. It was on the theme, Sweden is a humanitarian superpower. There were no actually serious debate about the security situation in Sweden. What is going on? Perhaps here and there somebody said, is this going on also in Sweden? How, how is the temperature in some of the mosques in Sweden. And I do not say all, because this is, of course, a very big problem for the Muslim communities in Sweden, struggling with, uh, with prejudice and Islamophobia from the Swedish citizens. That talking about this, they feel pointed out, they feel that they, we point out every Muslim. So it's a very delicate debate. But the security issues were not highlighted, and they are highlighted now, but there are no, as I said, no strategy, no control, and no coordination. <coughs> Several of the speakers have talked about moral clarity as a very important um, point to counter terrorism. And we do not have moral clarity. The whole debate in Sweden is actually a moral one, creating not so little confusion in the public debate. And the public debate also has a great influence uh, on our politicians Left or right, it doesn't matter. The politicians are very afraid of giving another picture of Sweden than, than the one that Sweden is a humanitarian, thank you, humanitarian um, superpower. We have also, we have a, a tremendously uh, severe uh, uh, immigration crisis with the conflicts and wars in Syria and a lot of human suffering. But actually, the Swedish border controller police have said that they have lost control, control over our borders. We don't know who is coming to our country. 85% of the immigrants coming do not have any papers to identify themselves. And it's also a risk that there are people there uh, that may be uh, connected to ISIS. ISIS has said that they are going to send people into the streams of refugees. We don't know how many and we don't know if they have, but they have said so. And the police in Sweden has also have some suspicions on certain persons. But um, they have also 
officially acknowledge that they don't have control. And of course, that is not a good thing for a society. It doesn't create, uh, uh, of course, not create a, a sense of um, security. The complicated climate when it comes to discussing the issues and also turbulent political situation with the minority coalition in Sweden and also more and more urge for leadership in these issues. Well, I just, just have some few minutes, so I have to be very quick. What's gender got to do with it? Two things. Uh, only these two days, I think one person has mentioned uh, gen uh, some gender issue, uh, the ISIS views of women and what they are doing for horrendous crimes against women. Uh, my field of research is religion and gender, and actually the, the roles, the gender roles, is an intrinsic system in a religion. It's also a motivation. The way you view men and women is a, also a motivation in the religion. It's, a reli it's in the core of the religious systems and must not be overlooked. The other thing is the gender issues is also a way to, to highlight that is also a way to communicate the clashes between the different value systems. That has been quite effective in Sweden in, in recent debates actually to show that in these enclaves we have women living under Sharia law. Do we want that? Then suddenly people are beginning to understand that we are, we are having clashes between value systems and we have to address them and we have to find solutions. But there we are not we are in a debate about it, but we do not have the solutions. But we are beginning to addressing the problem, beginning to look at the problem, beginning to admit that actually we have Sharia laws in some of the enclaves in Sweden, and this is clashing with our state uh, ideology that's equality. So that's one of the debates that can be very fruitful in uh, in uh, getting people to understand the problem. The solution, as you already figured out, addressing the issues, speaking the truth about the issues, facing the facts, avoid the emotional blackout that comes with these horrible situations we, with immigrants we have, not fall into an emotional blackout, but trying to face the facts, the challenges, the possibilities, and the threats in a, uh, in a sane and logic way. Leadership, uh, decisions have to be made. Coordination, to have a national coordination, a national program, a national strategy, to cope with these issues. Legal actions, we have suggestions given by politicians, but the debate, uh, we have the clashes between uh, the privacy problem, human rights problem, and the more uh, effective legal tools to cope with this. And they are clashing all the time, and we are not uh, getting further. There's a new suggestion, but it has a lot to do also with the dialogue between different, different groups. Um, and dialogue is not enough. We have had dialogue for a decade. Now we have 300 people at least re going to Syria to fight and a lot of others sympathizing. Dialogue has not worked out as we thought. It's very important with dialogue but we have to think new because it hasn't worked the way we thought. And stop funding. In Sweden, we have actually uh, nourished this environment with, uh, who radicalize young people in certain mosques and certain uh, congregation in Sweden. We know who they are and we are still with tax money funding these organizations and these congregations. Stop the funding, that's one of the most important things to do right now. But I do not see uh, that kind of suggestion. We have a debate about it. But I don't think there are any uh, Swedish politician today that actually is going to affect this. So you see. But 
everything is not dark, but this is a very, very challenging uh, period in, in Sweden and, I dare say, in the Swedish history. Thank you. Thank you, Annika. Please, Professor Rohn Gunnar Ratner. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to focus on two areas. One is I want to speak to you about the current de-radicalization programs. Finally, I want to share some insights that we have gained after interviewing those returnees from Syria to the Asian region. I had the opportunity of interviewing about two dozen of those uh, fighters. And we see some challenges that we are facing of uh, implementing the existing DRAD programs on the, uh, these uh, returnees. And I thought that because this is a small group of people, I'll be able to speak very openly and very frankly. I recognize in the audience uh, Brian Jenkins, who pioneered the study of terrorism in the United States. Uh, he mentored Bruce Hoffman, and I had the privilege of studying under Bruce Hoffman. Uh, let me share with you that uh, the Israeli method of fighting terrorism is primarily kinetic, what you call operational counterterrorism. The Israelis are so good in tactical counterterrorism, they have neglected the dimension of strategic counterterrorism. Uh, the Israelis have failed in many ways in winning the fight. Uh, because they did not look at the most strategic aspects of fighting terrorism. Tactically, they are the masters. We have all learned from them. But I want to share a little bit with you about our own understanding of how to fight terrorism in the strategic uh, areas. <clears throat> so, there is upstream counter-radicalization, that is largely prevention, that is rebutting the terrorist message and promoting moderation. That is called prevention, that is called counter-radicalization. Then downstream, there is terrorist rehabilitation. Many Westerners, Americans, Europeans, Israelis don't believe in rehabilitation or derad. They think that when you become a terrorist, very difficult to change the terrorist mindset. I recall a correspondence with the EU coordinator for counterterrorism a few years ago. He said Europe is not ready for these programs. So I will share with you a little bit of what we have done. We have had some successes, some failures, and some of these practices may be of some use to our friends in Europe and in America. <clears throat> uh, the oldest rehabilitation program was started by the British in Malaya to rehabilitate the communists. Uh, General Templer, uh, General Clutterbuck, these were in many ways involved in that program. Then of course, uh, in Kenya, the British started a program to rehabilitate the Mau Mau uh, insurgents. I personally visited Kenya to study the Kenyan uh, program as well. Uh, in Malaysia, the communist program was a very impressive one. We visited uh, where the program was conducted in Malaysia. A very simple program, but uh, very successful. Uh, primarily, it is a re-education of those who have been arrested or those who have surrendered. But in the contemporary period, we saw that uh, those who applied uh, DRED for the first time, they were the Egyptians, the Egyptian uh, intelligence service. They got clerics from Al-Azhar University and uh, paid these clerics, looked after them, and told the clerics, you have to come to the prisons in Egypt and start the program, a very successful program. Of course, the Egyptians used a lot of torture and very brutal methods uh, on their detainee population, but those who cooperated, those who recanted, uh, rehabilitation was a good way out for them. And many were reintegrated back to society. A very small group of uh, both EIJ, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, and the Islamic group of Egypt, 
these members uh, they didn't reform and they went to pakistan and later formed the tier 1 leadership uh, and tier 2 leadership of al qaeda of course ayman al zawahiri was the was the most uh, well known uh, person in that group uh, we saw that uh, after 911 a uh, number of programs emerging one is the malaysian program the malaysian special branch a uh, very effective security and intelligence service launched a program in kamunteng the old british rehab facility in malaysia singapore isd the internal security department a very effective security and intelligence service launched their program in singapore the saudis launched their program probably the largest program to rehabilitate muslims uh various programs started in other countries few other countries some of them failed for example the algerian program um to rehabilitate the gia then of course in uzbekistan uh, it is one of the least published uh, publicized programs but a very successful program the uzbekistan government uh, their intelligence service working with the islamic U university in tashkent uh, launched a program Indonesians uh, have uh, ad hoc rehabilitation program not a structured program or not a comprehensive program then we have also seen that non muslim terrorists they also there were many rehabilitation programs that started in india uh, program against the maoists the north eastern uh, uh, militants or terrorists then also in kashmir a uh, program to rehabilitate muslim terrorists and in sri lanka a very successful terrorist rehabilitation program was started to rehabilitate the tamil tigers uh, in fact i personally was involved uh, in that program 12000 terrorists surrendered or they were captured and they were rehabilitated and released so primarily there are uh, six uh prongs of rehabilitation six modes or the six approaches of rehabilitation we have seen with regard to muslim terrorists the most successful program is uh, the religious rehabilitation where you use uh, muslim clerics to go and rehabilitate a terrorist you can't send any cleric for rehabilitation in fact in our own specialty center i have a number of clerics and we train them how to rehabilitate we first uh, make sure that they have very good credentials most of them studied at alaza university and they underwent courses in psychology and counseling so the first thing we teach them is when you go go and meet the detainee don't talk to the detainee you just listen to him and build a personal friendship it is that personal relationship that ultimately helps so rehabilitation is never to change someone's mind directly it is always you approach the mind through the stomach or through the heart that is you build a very close relationship with him with his family look after him look after his children and make sure that friendship that usually a terrorist or a insurgent group offers that you start to offer that that is why in rehabilitation other than the religious rehab where you try to correct the misconceptions because all terrorist groups they uh, they use the quran and the hadith but they gi they give their own interpretation i'll just give you one phrase al wala wal bara al wala wal bara means loyalty to the muslims and uh, disavowal of non muslims this is according to the critics according to those who are with isis and other groups but if you ask a mainstream cleric he will say it is loyalty to good things and you keep away from bad things uh, even the word called jihad is been interpreted and misinterpreted basic concepts like bay'ah the oath of allegiance so these islamic concepts the mainstream clerics go and have a discussion a debate uh, give the uh, the detainee uh, or the inmate books to read and have dialogues and sessions and over a period of time he or she changes the mind second is educational rehabilitation third is vocational rehabilitation where you give a new set of skills and the fourth is social and family rehab this is a very effective method of rehabilitation in singapore we have created a group called the aftercare group 
where we look after the wives and the children of the detainees. I'll just share one experience with you when a father was arrested. 14 year old boy told the police officers who came and looked at the father and said, Dada, you terrorist? Very good, Dada. So you can see that the whole family was radicalized because they believe they saw videos of what was happening in Afghanistan where the civilians were being killed and they said that civilians are being deliberately killed by the Americans and it is our duty to protect the Muslims, we have to fight back. So even that child was indoctrinated. So in my office we have a female cleric called Ustaza and her main task is to rehabilitate the children and to engage the wives. So it's a very comprehensive mode of rehabilitation. We have had a lot of success in the, to, to break the regeneration of terrorists by focusing on the children. We make sure they go to school. I still recall there's one child, when he went to school, the other children tell, told, your father is a communist. Communist means your father is a terrorist. And then gradually that child was moved to another school where his real identity was not known, his, that his father was in custody. So the state, working with NGOs, with the private sector, look, looked after these children and build a very strong partnership with those families. And some of these terrorists, they, we made sure that they went and studied at schools. And in the case of Sri Lanka, many of the uh, children, there were 400 children in the Tamil Tigers. And I'm very proud to say that many of them are today at high school or they've gone to university. And some of them text me every morning. In fact, there's one girl, every day in the morning, she sent me SMS. Good morning, sir. You see, so sometimes my wife wonders why this girl is texting me every day. So, and she recently she got married. I especially went for her wedding. So, she asked me what is the gift. She, I asked her what is the gift you want. She said, give me two cows. Give me two cows. So, because she is going to agriculture with her husband. Her husband was a former terrorist. Another guy, he was a uh, terrorist, a very bright guy. He is now pizza delivery. He is delivering pizza, Do you know, Domino Pizza, right? So, we made sure that they had a life beyond terrorism. And uh, so, social and family rehabilitation. Another is creative arts in rehabilitation. In fact, I want to tell you the Sri Lankan case. Some of the girls who learn to kill, women who learn to kill. When they, were first brought, when they were first brought to the detention center, I still remember they don't want to sleep in the beds because they can't sleep. They were given the same beds that usually are in barracks because they say it's too hot. We have been sleeping in the jungle. You see, so they were sleeping outside the, 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 the facility, you see, in the garden space. So it's a huge transformation. And uh, they had never seen themselves in the mirror for a very long time because they were in the jungles. And they were so fascinated to have these small mirrors. And I want to share with you that they, under, they took a course, many of these women took a course in beauty culture, beauty treatment. And now they look all look very beautiful. And uh, there was even a, a parade, uh, like a catwalk, some of the women participated in it. So they discovered their femininity uh, after so many years. Because when they were in the terrorist group, they all want to be like men. Fight, you see. So they've transformed a lot. Many of them repented, re expressed remorse. Um, and they got married. And they're leading normal lives. They don't want to go back to violence or extremism. Because they were very well looked after. And when they left the detention centers, the banks came forward and they gave them loans so they can, they can start small businesses. I also want to share with you another was recreational and sports rehabilitation. The military officers who fought with them, they gave them their bats, their soccer balls, their football, their equipment, you see, and they left them. So there's a big debate because there's a lot of Western human rights organizations putting pressure, especially on Sri Lanka. So uh, the government asked for my opinion. The rehabilitation program, should the officers who are in these facilities, should they be in uniform 
or should be, they be in civils? I said, no, put them in uniform because they have to make friends. They have to accept the reality. This is the army of the state, you see. And they made such a good friendship. And those military officers have built a very close personal relationship with those detainees. It is that personal friendship that matters. There's nothing more important than that. If you have a problem, even if you have a traffic violation, you see, sometimes they will call one of the officers they met in the camp and say, this man is trying to charge me now. Can you speak to him? You see, a small favor in a third world country, that matters. You see, because if a senior officer speaks to a traffic policeman and tell him, free this man, just forgive him this one time. He's try trying to make his life work. You know, they, they, it counts a lot. So the, the, the relationship that was built, the... The former terrorists never played against the officers. They always mixed teams and played. Another mode of uh, rehabilitation we had was cultural rehabilitation. And I want to speak to you a little bit about Pakistan because our specialist counterterrorism center in Singapore, 2009 we went to Pakistan and we conducted the first DRED workshop in Peshawar, both for the police and the army, but primarily for the police. Police failed to start a rehab program in Pakistan, but the army started a program and now they have two facilities, Rashtun and Sabawun. Ashtun for the adults, Taliban, Sabawun for the children. With regard to Sabawun, when I visited Sabawun, I spent about a week uh, there in Suat Valley. Uh, Sabawun, I was so pleased. The Taliban member, he is reading a book about Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. So he starts to understand his own heroes. Otherwise his heroes will be Bin Laden, Ayman al-Zawahiri, Mullah Omar. So it's a cultural rehabilitation. This is another very important mode of rehab. Then, of course, psychological rehab. In the Singapore context, there are three individuals, uh, three groups that will evaluate a detainee's progress before he or she is released. One is the team of psychologists. Second is the staff who work in the detention center. And third are the case officers, those who are familiar with the atrocity that he or she committed or planned to commit. These three teams will work. I also want to share with you from the University of Maryland from start, Professor Ari Kruklansky and Michelle Gelfand, both of them came and they worked with our rehab team, our rehab capacity building team, and evaluated the programs that we have done. And in many of these countries, uh, Ari and Michelle both are uh, psychologists, they did what is called attitude and opinion survey. So whenever someone is arrested, they do attitude and opinion survey. A series of questions are asked to determine their understanding of Islamic concepts, say jihad, their attitude towards government, their attitude towards uh, different Muslim groups, Muslim leaders. So they ascertain this. And this survey is implemented periodically, every three to six months. So now for the first time, we have data from these rehabilitation centers, whether rehabilitation has worked or not. Rehabilitation is not the 100% answer. There are many people whom we cannot rehabilitate. So we should be prepared to keep many detainees in custody for a very long period of time. So those who are engaged in rehab, they have to work very closely with the judicial authorities. There must be a legal and a governance framework because if you progress well in rehabilitation, certainly then you can be recommended for early release. Let me conclude once again and repeat what I said when I spoke at the plenary. You have to start rehabilitation programs. Americans failed miserably to start the program in Guantanamo Bay. About a third of those who have been released in Gitmo, they have gone to head terrorist programs, support terrorist programs, or join their own, uh, their old uh, terrorist organization. I believe that rehabilitation is not the 100% answer, but it is a weapon, a very important weapon that we have to use. But the success of rehabilitation depends on many factors, but mostly it depends on reintegration. That is, after the custodial phase of rehabilitation, there's what you call a community rehabilitation phase. You have to ensure that the detainee is engaged or the inmate who has been released is engaged over a very long period of time. I thank you very much. Thank you, Rowan. Uh
Danielle, you want to take the podium, please? What you like? What you like? And put the Mediterranean map, the big one. Not the Mediterranean. Hi everyone, and thank you for ICT for inviting me, and especially thank you to Tulu, this beautiful girl, which is helping us on the event. And you see, of course, the map of the Mediterranean. And uh, I am not an expert on this, but as a war correspondent and a reporter in Italy, I started to ask to my friends in the intelligence services of Italy, uh, what about the Italian de-radicalization program? And the answer was, we don't have any. So that was interesting from the start, because you ask yourself, how is possible to get hundreds of thousands of people through Lampedusa mainly, uh, without having major problems? You may find many answers. First of all, Italy is mainly a transit country. So they go through Lampedusa. Lampedusa, by the way, I, uh, maybe you know that Lampedusa is not part of Europe, but is uh, geographically part of Africa. It's 70 miles from Africa. And it tells you a lot about Italy. We are just uh, in front of uh, Tunisia, and uh, Libya and Algeria, and our fishermen are working with them uh, together since the humanity started. So we know each other, they know us, uh, they know how to cross, uh, and it's very easy. It's like uh, Key West and Miami and Cuba is nothing. So uh, you have many reasons to understand why Italy is in some way is a special case. Because is, uh, uh, we, we have a, a very weak and desperate colonial story, for instance. We were just in Libya and in uh, Eritrea and a few years in Ethiopia and so And the Italians were mainly peasants and fishermen in these countries. So we don't have a strong heritage of conflict with these uh, people populations. And the biggest Italian community was in Tunisia, by the way, where Sicilian, more than 100,000 people, like Claudia Cardinale was born in Tunisia. So, and they were, again, poor people sharing the life with the Arabs and having a lot in common. We, we still eat uh, couscous in Sicily, not as a foreign food, but as a part of the Italian culture. So when they arrive in these uh, crazy place that Lampedusa is in the middle of nowhere, they are just trying to go through. And they find a strange country, because Italy has 60 million people, but has inside the Vatican, the super, super soft power of the world, 1 billion to 100 million uh, members. And the Italian authorities and the police has to manage a country where, just to give you an example, when Pope John uh, uh, Paul II died, we got uh, 7 million people for the funerals in Rome. And uh, you probably have, uh, maybe in New York during the UN Assembly, in, in a situation, in a comparable, but probably 
Rome is in the worst situation to manage because the Italian police, which has not the budget comparable to the American, and so has to work with a lot of human intelligence, with a lot of common sense, and uh, they have to manage a situation where the protection is not the protection of Italy alone, but is a protection of the Vatican, which is one of the main targets of ISIS, for instance. If you go online, you see that the Vatican Vatican will be destroyed, and so and we will have the jubileum in in few months from now. And the Italian authorities are mad on this because they know perfectly that is the target, one of the target in Italy. But you find a strange country because the uh, Catholic Church makes a lot of differences in Italy. You you may say, well, is a Catholic country? No, Spain, uh, Spain, for instance, is a Sp uh, is a Catholic country, but you don't have the same situation. The Vatican and the Catholic Church in Italy is extremely well organized. We have, uh, I have just a, a, a small map, if it, can you help me to show uh, the map of the um, parish in Italy. We have more than 25,000 parish, double than in Germany, which is much bigger than Italy. In this situation, when Two days ago, the Pope said every parish has to get two, three, or four refugees. It means 100,000. A lot. So the state of Italy can say yes or no to the refugees, but the Vatican will say, just do it, because we do it. Second, when you arrive in Lampedusa, you find the Italian Red Cross Red Cross with water, food, and help. They generally do not register you because we don't want to get 2,000, 200,000 refugees in Italy because you know the European rules. If you register them, so we let them go. But if they stay as, as clandestine, they get health care, for instance. So you imagine, if you, if you go to the hospital in Italy, no one will ask for an ID. You will be taken care in any case. The Catholic Church of Italy will host, and this hosting about directly one third of all the refugees, Muslim. They have food, help inside the Catholic Church structures. So the approach of the Italian Catholic Church is extremely friendly. They don't discriminate in some way. So at the end of the day, you can have a lot of radicalized people, but you don't see many reason to be against a country where people don't care. They, we just try to survive in a difficult environment, and if you compare just Italy with France, in France they forbid the veil. We don't forbid the veil. My, my grandmother was using this, we don't care, maybe we care about the color of the veil, if it's fashionable or not, but we don't care about what you are. For instance, the Catholic Church again, when they started to come, Sri Lankan people for instance, they gave them empty parishes, churches, to the national community, not to the Catholic of Sri Lanka, to the national community in Milan. When they got tsunami, they all had a natural uh, movement to congregate inside this place because they, they didn't have any other places to go, and they self-organized their, their community, the help. Then the Italian local authorities gave them for free two air cargo to transport help to Sri Lanka for free. So the Italian community said the message was very clear. We are with you. So you are not so far from us in, in, in the trouble that as Italian we experienced many times during the Second World War and so and so. Again, uh, the, uh, for, just to give another example, in Milan, the Catholic Church has given to the Egypt Christian cop, not Catholics, their own church. So the message is, okay, don't discuss the differences and so and so, try to find a solution. Then you have a second, second, uh, point, which is very interesting. We come out of red brigades, terrorism, for years, a, a bloody war, where the authorities, the policemen, the intelligence service were trained 
to spot trouble. The Red Brigade had a lot of popular support, a lot of popular support. People pretending not to see or helping in some way these few thousand terrorists, but it was a very serious phenomenon. So we have, uh, if you compare Italy to France again, we have a different, or to Germany, in Italy we had terrorism, which is still fresh in the memory of the policemen and carabinieri and so on. Then a third element, we have high level of criminality in the South. In the South, mafia many times control the territory. So if you want to do something, something wrong in the south of Italy, it will be a big problem. You will have to deal with the state and also with the criminality. So you get an agreement with them like the Chinese, for instance, in Naples, or you go nowhere. You go nowhere. Then we have the village mentality, which is very funny. In the village of Italy, the uh, Maresciallo dei Carabinieri knows everything about us, everything. He has no budget, nothing, but he will ask around and know how do you misbehave with your wife. And he will call you and say, John, I know that you have some trouble, some problem. I don't want to tell you how much problems my wife is giving to me. I understand, your, you know, women, women, women. Then please behave properly. Don't put yourself, I mean, you ask it for a new license, for a new shop, come back in one month and I will see what I can do, and so and so and so. So they know everything about you. The community is helping the authorities. If the authorities have something to think about you, they will be in a few minutes, they know everything about you. They will speak with the priest, with the local, the, the manager of the local bank, with the mayor, and in a few minutes they will know everything about you. In the big cities, of course, we have more problems because you cannot control. But we have some experience. We started about 15 years ago because it's a young immigration in Italy. We are at the second generation. So you cannot compare Italy with France where you have people of fourth generation non-integrated in the Italian society and so So we started to have some problem. For instance, we have the uh, mail delivery by moto, and they started the Arabs to do this in Milan, which is the stock exchange. I mean, it's a big business. And they started to know very well the inside of the buildings and so And the authorities spotted this, and they in some way moved this business to the Peruvian, to the Latin American people, which now are in a kind of monopoly of delivering this. And uh, you have other situation where, for instance, the Catholic Church at some point a few years ago reoriented the, the immigration. They helped people from Philippines, from Sri Lanka, from Latin America to come to Italy. And they help family reunification, which is also very important because generally when you come from North Africa, where mainly are uh, the problem from, for Italy in the prisons, and so you, mainly people from North Africa, Albania, and Romania, but that's for other reasons, uh, they are without a family, so they are in a troubled situation. I mean, uh, they are very nervous and so and so and so. Then you have also some locally interesting experience, like if Tulu helped me uh, to show you, we have the Jewish community, small Jewish community, we have about less than 40,000 Jews, mainly in Rome, Milan, Turin, and a few other places. This is, no, is the other, uh, the print, this one. You see here, security. This is a monthly bulletin of the Jewish community in Milan, but you have the same situation in Rome and so on. This is a monthly review that reach every Jewish family in Italy. It tells you, uh, if you have a private party, say bar mitzvah, whatever, in an hotel, you send us an, S a an email to the Jewish community security. And that's all. That's all we do. Of course, the Jewish community has a very, very good relation with the Italian police. So they have a map, live map, of how many 
marriages you have in Milan tomorrow morning. They will not send the American-style army troops and whatever, nothing of this kind, but a very Italian marshal or whatever without any uniform, so to give a, a look around. So the authorities have a very good level of cooperation. In fact, the security in the Rome ghetto is considered one of the best in the world because of the cooperation between the local population and the authorities. And here comes my point. The difference is not about how the police deals with this problem, but how the population help the authorities. When I was living in London, there was during what the British called the troubles, uh, uh, you were always invited to tell to the policeman if something, uh, you know, a bag, whatever, in the metro and so. And it happened to me, and uh, no policeman said, oh, don't disarm me or what you do. We have in some way in Italy the same approach that the French don't have. I was uh, uh, traveling last, uh, two weeks ago between Milan and Paris by TGV, the same day, the same hour of the killing on the Amsterdam-Paris train. There was no control from Milan to Paris at all of any ID, any baggage, anything. And this is the final point where Mike, I know that Mike is one of the best experts on the European cooperation or non-cooperation because they have been told that there are many, many problems of cooperation, that Europol is working in some way well and Interpol a disaster or almost a disaster and so. But when you don't have any kind of cooperation between the different police and no one comes to check and you don't have the public opinion inside, say, the Jewish district of Paris with the French police and so, you are alone because everyone can come and destroy whatever while in Italy, I have the impression that this is not the situation, that the cooperation is much better, that is the only solution for the police to have some kind of control of the territory. So to conclude everything, you have to remember that the Italian approach to the Muslim immigrant is in some way soft. So we don't have a model that easily will be an enemy for you because we don't have a model. So in Italy, the state is weak. Everyone is complaining. If you watch the TV or read the Italian media, you will see that it's like in the Israeli parliament, you have people of any kind of idea, shooting each other and so And this, in my opinion, is helping in some way to have the situation under some kind of control, where the Muslim imam will be interviewed and the other guy is saying, oh, you have to go back to your country. So, so you don't need to go and become violent, ultra-violent, and we have about 50,000 lone wolves, and we have problems, and we, we risk. But at the end of the day, I have the impression that the level of local intelligence and the help of the Catholic Church and also mafia in the South make the environment not so easy for uh, radicalized people, and uh, maybe we experience problems among the second generation of Muslim because they tend to integrate in the Italian society, and the fathers, especially with the girls, the daughters, are not happy about this. So we see this. This, but you see, Italy has a lot of roots also with the Mediterranean and Arab countries. My father was not so modern, open mind, and so with my, my sister, for instance. So it's not so difficult for me to understand what's in his mind. I, we are not in Sweden. We are in the south of Europe. That's all. Thank you. Daniele, thank you very much. Susan, please. I suggest that 
when uh, Sultan has made his presentation, uh, we have a five minute break and then resume with questions and answers. Thank you, Mr. Vine. <coughs> my fellow panelists <clears throat> and distinguished members of the audience. I have been asked to speak about best practices in South Asia, my neighborhood. I come from India. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I do not have any best practices to, to report. More either non-existent practices of de-radicalization or faulty practices. So my presentation will be more of a critique, but probably some suggestions that might help later. <clears throat> As for India, where I come from, there is no particular de-radicalization policy. One reason for this <clears throat> is that Islamist terrorism that we face comes from Pakistan as part of proxy war. Uh, that Pakistan has been waging since 1989. Even before that, but since 1989 in great earnest. So most of the terrorists who come are suicide bombers, etc., and they get killed. We have been able to capture only three so far. Uh, but perhaps uh, the government of India is changing its policy or something, because two we got, uh, we caught uh, only in the last fortnight. So maybe, you know, there is some uh, policy change in that. <clears throat> the new government that we have is trying to formulate uh, a policy of de-radicalization, but so far nothing has come out of it. Another reason is that uh, terrorism comes in law and order uh, problem, and law and order is a state subject, which is to be dealt with by provinces. So different states can have different approaches. In Kashmir, for instance, and where there is more terrorism has been for a long time. So the government of Kashmir does have some kind of de-radicalization programs in the sense that it approaches some militants in the prison and, uh, you know, uh, confronts them with some clerics, etc., who will tell them something different. Uh, but nothing is known about how. The third and the most important problem uh, that we have in India is that our strategic experts do not think that uh, India is facing any terroristic problem. They, they feel very proud of saying that our Muslims are different from the rest of the world. Because our Muslims live in a multi-religious, multicultural, multilingual kind of society, and they are very well integrated. They are not immigrants. They are sons of soil. And we do not really have a problem. This betrays. A, either ignorance or denial. Because I live in the society, I work in the society, and I know that the radicalization is started by the petrodollar Islam, as I call it. You know, it started since 1974, when uh, petrodollars, uh, you know, the, when the oil prices uh, quadrupled, <clears throat> and Saudi Arabia got a large budget to uh, promote Wahhabism and Salafism. So since then, uh, there has been a lot of radicalization. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims have gone to Saudis and the Gulf and come back and radicalized and built mosques that they proudly call now Salafi mosques. You see, when I was a young boy, they, I used to hear of a Wahhabi somewhere in distant, you know, some place who will be hiding his uh, Wahhabi uh, uh, affiliation. But today, even in distant Kerala, you find, even in villages, you find small places where uh, people will be proudly displaying their Salafi association. So I feel that uh, the, our strategic thinkers need to change their uh, mindset and hope they do that uh, before it is too late. Uh, <clears throat> I will also talk a little bit about Pakistan. It got radicalized uh, greatly, as you know, during the anti-Soviet Afghan war. And President General Ziaul Haq's decade-long rule, which he called Nizami Mustafa, he was from 1977 till his death in 88. Uh, this was the period when jihadi madrasas were created and funding for the Afghan war. But Pakistan used the same madrasas to also create uh, terrorists who will be fighting in India and who will be uh, promoting their proxy war in India, and particularly in Kashmir. 
at that time mostly it was kashmir then later on it moved to other parts of india also now pakistan does have a de-radicalization program but it is strictly meant for those terrorists who hit pakistan or who, who hit pakistan army pakistan government officials pakistan army children uh, they do not want to de-radicalize those terrorists in fact they want to encourage them promote radicalization for those terrorists who are fighting against india so like lashkar e taiba etc which are you know directed whose terrorism is directed towards india they will be promoted they will be helped so it's a very curious situation in which uh, pakistan army officials go and talk to taliban for instance members of tehreek e taliban pakistan and uh, uh, i am aware of some of the dialogue that takes place in those talks and it feels very surreal you know because it is the taliban who win the arguments with these people the reason is the same as happens in saudi arabia sometimes because what they do is they tell these terrorists that it's not wrong to want to kill infidels or apostates but in saudi arabia they would say that it's wrong to do so or join a war without the consent of the sovereign in pakistan they would say that it's uh, it's not uh, right to kill pakistanis you can kill indians you know you can kill americans but not pakistanis and uh, the taliban what they do is in this dialogue that takes place this is uh, available if anybody is interested on my website called newageislam.com newageislam.com so this dialogue between a pakistani army official and the taliban scholar because what the taliban scholar does is that uses the same authorities that the pakistan army official is quoting to prove that pakistanis and particularly pakistan government officials and army people are kafirs and apostates and it's our duty to kill them and pakistan army official seems to be you know completely at at bay confused what to how to counter that because he is quoting the same authority and the same quran and hadith that you were quoting to counter him uh this confusion in pakistan because since they want to de-radicalize they want to save themselves from one set of radicals and want to promote another set of radicals so this is uh this creates a very interesting situation like for instance my website newageislam.com we regularly refute using quranic uh, uh sources and all the only mostly quranic uh, practices citing quran all the time uh publications from taliban like nawai afghan jihad or azan which is an al qaeda publication or dabiq which is an isis publications so we we uh, counter and refute them point by point and uh, about 2 years ago uh, the nawai afghan jihad published a series of articles for 8 months uh, written by al abiri who is a famous uh, a cleric from taliban side saying that uh, killing civilians is allowed in islam in certain situations and how and why so this was a long article it went on for 8 months in a series we uh, started uh, refuting that using the same sources using quran and uh, this refutation i would have thought that any country which is interested in de-radicalization would welcome that but what happened was that even before we could finish our series our website got banned in pakistan they first banned a few pages which were dealing with the refutation and uh, particularly in urdu because our, ours is a multilingual website in urdu hindi arabic and french as well so they first banned a few urdu pages they, they then they banned the english pages of uh, this refutation and then they banned the whole website so this is because this was probably having an impact in general which they do not want Now I'll talk a little bit about Maldives, which is a very important country in our region. A small one; it has only three hundred thousand people, but something like fifty to hundred uh, terrorists seem to have joined ISIS in recent days. Maybe more, because this is the figure that has come from the government. Now, this is a hundred percent Muslim country. 
a country which does not allow citizenship to non muslims is by definition a, an exclusivist maybe you can even call it an extremist country you know by by definition the constitution itself doesn't allow uh, inclusive society so so that is one problem the former but the, there is a, there is a, a possibility there which is that uh, there are many clerics there who studied in jamia al azhar there is a group which studied in saudi arabia you see children uh, in from maldives go to saudi arabia or cairo in egypt for studies right from their childhood so this set of uh, uh, clerics who have come from jamia al azhar are more amenable to change and you can talk to them and you can find them that they are willing to listen to you the government of president rashid had invited me to speak to these clerics they had uh, from all over the country and i spoke to them and i found that it is possible with sustained effort to to de-radicalize them to a certain extent because they were asking questions they are people willing to open up and and they were willing to question me so i was able to answer them and they were willing to accept those answers as well so in maldives if if a de-radicalization is sustained at the at a certain level sustained effort is made it can be successful However, uh, in Bangladesh, there is a secular government, and uh, this is the only country where I find that tens of thousands of Muslims come out on the streets demanding action against radicals. This I don't think happens in any other Muslim majority country. So uh, Bangladesh is is a good example. There is no de-radicalization program there as such, because the uh, radicals that the government catches, they just want to uh, move uh, legally against them and give them prison sentences, and hang them to death sometimes. And uh, the the political party, the ruling political party, just organizes conferences and marches. Uh, Uh, promoting the positive side of islam promoting islam as a religion of peace this is the approach that they have in bangladesh uh as the time is very short i will just tell you that one of the reasons why the uh the de-radicalization efforts do not succeed these interactions of so called reformist uh, uh, clerics with the radicals doesn't succeed is because the the reformist clerics also use the same language the same theology that the uh, radicals have the essence of the theology is the same i will cite one sentence from a recent uh, open letter to baghdad sent by 120 uh, uh, scholars mullahs clerics etc globally from all over the world to al baghdad is an open letter in which there is one sentence which says everything in the quran is the truth and everything in authentic hadith is divinely inspired <coughs> now this is a very illogical uh, uh, statement because hadith was created uh, 200 300 years after the demise of the prophet and it was the prophet who was getting revelation so how can it be called uh, divine but this is the statement coming from moderate ulama from people who are opposing al baghdadi and so it's na- quite natural that such statements will be used by the baghdadi group and the people like them to say that there is no difference between our theology and their theology uh i would simply say that hadith is one of the major problems because muslims seem to have more respect for hadith use hadith much more than they do quran and one of the uh, examples that i will cite to you is that uh, there is a verse in quran chapter 2 verse 145 which calls the temple mount in jerusalem as the qibla of the christians and jews it tells muslims that kaaba in makka is your qibla while temple mount in jerusalem is their qibla this is the exact quranic verse 
This is chapter 2, verse 145. But uh, no scholar I have talked to, uh, no person that I have written about will accept this, that they should not be demanding Jerusalem or Bayt al-Muqaddas, they call it, as their first Qibla. There is no concept in Quran. In Hadith, there is, there is a lot of uh, talk about this. So this is one, uh, one uh, important point that we will have to see. see. See the theology that the reformist ulama or the moderate ulama have is the same as the theology of the radicals, then how can you actually change these people? So it is the moderate ulama who will have to work out and evolve gradually a moderate uh, theology of peace and pluralism and gender equality and coexistence and unless and until it is, it is done. And it will require a lot of patience, a lot of commitment, a lot of work. But this, I think, is the only solution because as long as we approach radicals with the same theology as they have, as all the reformist clerics seem to be doing at the moment. As I quoted to you from the, this letter for, to open uh, al-Baghdadi, you can read it on the internet. You will find that, that the radicals will find there is particularly, the basic theology is the same. The only difference will be that they will say don't implement it in this extreme manner. But then the radicals say that you are only being hypocritical because you are saying the same thing. If you, if you are saying that it is not wrong to try and want to kill infidels and apostates, then that's what I am doing. Then why are you saying that I am wrong? You are not doing, you are hypocritical. So this becomes the only difference. So it is the theology which will have to, be, to change. Thank you very much. Can I suggest that we have a five minute break and then resume with your questions uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, at the end of the break and, and how I proceed and uh, how I plan uh, to proceed. So five minutes please, if you can come back uh, at 25 to uh, 12. Okay. Can I just uh, make an announcement that the lunch, which for those who've been here before is normally held in the garden, uh, is being moved to the communications building. Um, I'll leave everyone out of those. You'll be led. <laughs> Five minute break. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We met in London. Yeah. We met before. Yeah. 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 I have a very good memory. Okay, so I have a memory for faces. I remember a face seen in the crowd. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it sounds like it's a whole the No, no, no. It's not in the late the Swedish Thank you. So I'm, I'm aware of it. Yeah, because I work in the joint I focus on transferring the things. Oh, the weather, well, I saw the north. I'm going to be sure. I mean, here for the tradition. The tradition of the intellectual discourse between the two walls. And from there, I went to Shelley, to Byron, to the Eileen Floyd, and I went to the British English can I ask you can I ask you to take your seats please and we'll resume. <laughs>